What's up, people? I'm Shaggy, the opinionated hippie, currently dealing with cedar fever like crazy here in Texas. You can hear the wind blow if I stop talking, which I'm not going to do. Um, and this is part seven of my reviewing and ranking Yes's live albums. I did their studio albums, and then in doing that, I discovered that they had way more live albums than I thought they ever had. I knew their first three. I knew the awesome box set Progeny. I knew no others. Uh, so I'm reviewing them from uh, start to finish, the officially released ones. Then there's a couple that I think are either, I don't know who released them, but not Yes. Um, I think the BBC Studios, I don't know, that just wasn't in their official list, but I'll eventually get to that. And there's a live Chicago concert or Cleveland concert that's out there that I checked out that's pretty good. Uh, but today it's The Word Is Live, a three CD box set. Um, that is different from most of the stuff I've come across so far. Most of their stuff after the 70s and 80s are complete shows. Um, shows that I think, not like a Frank tour where Frank recorded an entire tour and, or you know recorded a dozen shows and picked out the best. Um, most of the Yes stuff seems to be like, we're going to record the show, we're going to make a DVD, we're going to make an album, that's why we're doing this show. Uh, pick the venue, you know, special occasion. This box set is apparently all from like, or most of it is from Steve Howe's private collection of like radio performances. Um, I think most of it's all radio broadcasts. Um, yeah, and from concert tours and just, it's Steve Howe's personal collection. So the sound is definitely not as good as the other releases. And surprisingly, some of the worst sound is in the 80s um, when it sounds like maybe they are just like audience tapes or like, I don't know, cheap soundboard recordings with lots of generations. I don't know. Uh, they don't sound as good as some of the other stuff. You get three discs. The first disc, eight songs, uh, runs 70 and 71 only. Uh, disc two is 76 through 79. So we have a big leap, but that big leap is like progeny and yes show, shows, um, yes songs. So it kind of makes sense, that leap. And then the final disc is 78 all the way through the most recent thing is 1988. Uh, 26 songs on the original release, but now there's also a US release. I could only find the US release, so I was not able to track down then and for everyone the first two tracks, but I have the other 24 releases, other 24 songs. There are also two songs that were never studio released. And the whole purpose of this is to rank the songs. I'm ranking the individual songs based on how well they compare to the studio versions. So there's a, there's a cover of the Young Rascals, It's Love. It They take a three and a half minute song and turn it into an 11 minute, pretty awesome psych jam. Um, I compared it to the original. It's not as jazzy and sort of light as the Young Rascals leans into. This is a heavier, darker, more psyche version. It's fantastic. I'm not going to rank it because it's not a Yes Studio song that I can compare, but it's pretty awesome. Um, the other one is there is a song called Go Through This, a Steve Howe pen song that I think was supposed to be on like Tormato or Drama or was maybe from that era. It was, it's from a 1980 live performance, but I think it was supposed to be on one of those albums. Um, and it's sort of just like a straight up rocker. In fact, I even get some sort of like cheap trick vibes going through it. Um, I really liked it. I enjoy it. I don't have a studio version to compare it to. I've only heard it a couple times at this point in my life. So I don't know what its long-term effect is, but I like it. Um, I don't think either one of these would top the list, but they're both really good, neat additions. Um, the other 24 songs, I'm just going to talk through. Other 22 songs, I'm going to rank in the order from my least favorite as their live versions to my favorite as the live version. It says nothing to do with how I would rank their studio versions. It's just how I would rank the live versions. Because I like ranking things. If you've watched any of these videos, you know that. So let's get on to uh, number 22, Rhythm of Love. Uh, they open the, their big generator tour with this. So you get a lot of like, the band's about to come on stage, weird electronic and you know pre-recorded material before the band walks out. It's very 80s sounding. It's very dated. There's a couple little moments where you get a little rhythm of love tease that kind of works. But then it goes into Rhythm of Love, which is not one of my favorite songs, not one of my favorite albums. It's got its moments, but this live version, by the time they even get to the song, I'm tired of the, the bad sounding 80s stuff. 
easily number 22. Uh, number 21 is We Can Fly From Here. I mean, this is actually not from uh, the Fly From Here tour, or the whatever album this came from. Um, Fly From Here, is that what it's called? This doesn't seem right. Uh, but whatever album that's on, uh, this is actually from when I think it was also supposed to originally be on Drama, maybe, I think, Drama. Yeah, so you have, uh, you know, you have the Trevor Horn, uh, whatever that other guy's name was, Jeff, Jeff Downs, yeah, on it. Um, and it pretty much sounds the same as the original. It's from a 1980 show. I think I like the smoothness and the production and just the clean sound of the original better. This doesn't really add anything to it. 20 is Tempest Fugit. Love the song. Another one, I think I like the studio version better. I think the cleanliness of the production, this is a little more aggressive, but I'm not sure that's what I want for this song. I, I, I think the studio version was better. I like hearing it. Um, White and Squire also dropped like a little Tempest Fugit like little sample in their uh, Whitefish Jam from 9012 Live. Um, that's better than this, I think. Um, it's nice to hear, but a uh, Circus of Heaven is next. Um, I put this above Tempest Fugit, though I love Tempest Fugit way more than I like Circus of Heaven. But Circus of Heaven kind of does nothing for me on the album, does nothing for me here. It didn't actually go down. It just kind of tread water. Um, they also play that part where I think it's John Anderson's son is saying those lines. They play a pre, they play that recording over the loudspeakers, and I'd rather have John Anderson try to pretend to be his son and say it. I think that might have been a little more interesting. Um, Eighteen, shoot high, aim low. Again, not a song. A song I always think should go somewhere more than it does, and there is kind of an ending solo on here that maybe offers the possibility of going somewhere else, but it doesn't. I'm not the biggest Trevor Rabin fan. And it has this weird ending that they kind of tacked on that I don't think works as well as the studio version. Uh, there are parts that are neat, um, just because, you know, it does at times have a good vibe. Uh, but yeah, number 18. Uh, number 17 is Future Times Rejoice. Pretty much sounds the same as the album, maybe a little grittier. Doesn't offer much different than the studio version. Um, now we get to the stuff that I think all benefits from being live. We get 16 Apocalypse, which is the final section of And You and I. There was one tour when they used this as the opening music. And I think they're playing it live because the themes are just, they're muted. And the tone on the keyboard is a kind of a different tone. And it has an eerier quality about it. It just, it just seems a little more... It's just weird, um, but it's a neat song to hear to open a song before I think they go into Siberian Katru. Um, but it's yeah, I mean, there's it's it's a different version than the the actual end of And You and I. You know, it's not a fully developed song. I think it's only like a minute long or something like that. Oh no, it's a full three minutes of Apocalypse as the band comes out and warms up. But I don't know. It's really cool. It's a neat way to to open a song, and I, I would have been very happy had I been there. A neat way to open a show. 15, Your Move All Good People. Uh, this will always get points for having the, the drum transition and not the, the silent break before we drop into the dun 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 before we drop into the You're All Good People. Uh, I've seen All Good People. Um, always a great live song. Doesn't really vary much. Um, yeah. Uh, 14, Roundabout. We get the full thing. We get the full, whole roundabout. It's fantastic. The energy is fantastic. The playing is fantastic. We don't get that middle two, three, four. We skip the middle jam section. Nah, man, we get a full roundabout. Love it. Give me a roundabout. Don't skip that middle section. 90s and 2000s, yes. That's a crime. Roundabout makes it a 14. It's been last, I think, on every other, every other thing other than like yes songs, just because they usually skip that middle awesome prog jam. Uh, 13, Hello Chicago. This is just kind of a, 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 hey, audience, hello Chicago, you know, it was probably Hello Cleveland, other, other places. On Yes Set List, there is frequently a song that says tour song. Does anybody know? There's got to be at least one Yes fan watching who knows. Is Hello Chicago tour song? And whatever city they're in, they just changed it. I'm assuming they always changed it, but is this what is known as tour song on set list from this era? It's gotta be, right? It's gotta be. Um, but yeah, it's a neat little fun. John Anderson gets to interact with the band. It's got some good energy, some good playing. Yeah, yeah, good on you, yes. 12, Heart of the Sunrise. Um, 
Pretty much the only part of this song that ever really drastically changes is the intro section with Squire's sort of bass solo. That part is so playful and so much fun and so awesome. And it sounds like they're having a fantastic time. Yeah, this is a good Heart of the Sunrise. Like you can feel the live energy. Um, Squire always does something a little bit different in the intro, but this one, he's it's playful. Almost, it's kind of a little bit funkier at times. Yeah. Good job. You did a good job, Squire. Um, number 11 is Sound Chaser. Um, kind of pretty much the same song, but everything just feels a little less rush, feel rushed. Feels like there's a little more space in sort of that middle section. Feels like Hal is able to just, you know, he gets to get a little more playful, experiment a little, you know, just have a little more fun. Um, get to stretch out a little bit, breathe a little bit. Um, it's not dramatically longer, but I think it's like a minute and a half, two minutes longer. Uh, just pretty much give it how a little more time to, you know, flex his muscles and, and strut his stuff. I don't even think it's that much longer. Might even be much less than that, maybe like a minute. But that minute is fully used by by how just doing a little extra more. Um, and plus, it's got really good live energy. A perfect, a made for the live scene song, Sound Chaser. Uh, number 10 is Make It Easy, Owner of a Lonely Heart. This is pretty much here for the make it easy part, which if I'm not mistaken, was a Trevor Rabin written song that was going to be in the cinema band. And then when cinema became yes, because John Anderson joined, um, they didn't actually, they might, they recorded the songs. I know there's a version out there of the recorded song, but they used the really cool, dark, proggy riff part of it as the intro to Owner of a Lonely Heart. And they would play it, stop, Alan White would do his drum thing and they'd go into Owner of a Lonely Heart. Don't like the fact that Owner of a Lonely Heart still has all those horrible stabs and those horrible 80 production tricks live that they didn't try to think their way out of that. Um, Trevor Rabin solo is still Trevor Rabin solo. Um, but for that make it easy intro, it's completely worth it. And the end of it, when John Anderson gets to kind of like hype people up and like cheer them on, like you can do it, all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'm all for that. I'm all for the cheesy John Anderson, let's make us feel good vibe. A fun, fun ending. Uh, number nine is Hold On. Um, also from like this same tour as Make It Easy, Owner of a Lonely Heart. Uh, I think the big generator tour. I love Hold On Live. Uh, this is my favorite Rabin solo when he gets metal and squealy. And yeah, these are all from 88 in Houston. Um, squealy and metally and screechy. And he does his little shredding type thing. I think this is the only song it really, really works in. I love the beginning part. Before they go into the vocals, they have this wah, 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 wah little funky little thing they add. Yeah, Hold On was a, is a good song live. Yeah, they, they did a good job on that one. Uh, and now we get to the stuff that I think just kind of really, we're notching it up even a little more. Astral Traveler just sounds dirty and psyche and a little more raw and just a little more intense. And it sounds live in the best way possible. Um, number seven is Awaken. And this one gets this high. I've been putting Awaken kind of further down on previous lists because it's played pretty much the same. Waken Me gets a little chance to explore a little more in the beginning. Um, but in a lot, all the previous versions I've heard so far, which were of later performances, um, I think 2000s and 90s, that middle section when things get really calm and quiet was a lot more hectic and a lot louder. And like the percussion, the percussion elements weren't as muted as they were. This one... They nail the vibe. It is so low key and so chill. Definitely doesn't get to that low, low, low simmer that the studio version does, but they bring it down really, really, really well. And then when they make it into that tr transition into the latter part of the song, it, it just works perfectly. Um, the playing sounds fantastic. Like the written heavy part after the intro has a little bit of like, it's not, I don't, I, I still don't think I've heard a version of Awaken in which like that middle sort of prog heavy part is as dark sounding as the studio version, but this one has the most attitude out of all the ones I've heard so far. It has a little bit of just swag and yeah, this is a really good Awaken. Um, when did, when is this from? I think this is from like a 78 show. Uh, this is from a 79 show in Chicago. Um, uh, number six is a yours is no disgrace. Yeah, this is usually number one on any show it appears on. It's number six this time. You get your Steve Howe breakdown solo in the middle. The energy is fantastic. It's pretty heavy. Just feels like a really good heavy live rock version. But five other things happen to pull out the stops more than yours is no disgrace. Siberian Katru 
makes it above. That's number five. That ending solo by How sounds so good. He is going off. Like he is tearing it up. This is absolutely fantastic. This comes right after they open with Apocalypse. This is a 76 Siberian Katru. Detroit, Cobo Hall. Yeah, absolutely fantastic Siber uh, Siberian Katru. Uh, and then we get two absolute surprises at number four and number three, respectively. Sweet Dreams at four, Every Days at three. Both of them right in the middle, just dropping these awesome solos or not awesome jams. I think Sweet Dreams, we get this awesome house solo in the middle and this awesome, just great keyboard solo at the end, stretching this baby out. Every days, uh, we get this awesome jam in the middle, just like breakdown, let's go psych, let's go jam band, let's just stretch this thing out. Like these two songs together, like Every Days is clocking in at like 11 minutes. Sweet Dreams is clocking in at like, well, six and a half. But that that solo in the in the middle, that solo at the end, just lift these to just like, yeah, this is how you do something live, people. Um, yeah, just some really good stuff. Then we get number two. We get America, which is just all over the place with jam energy, the intensity of this performance, the sort of jams that are dropped in the middle. Like this thing is stretched out to like 16 minutes long. It's worth every ex every extra second of it. Like this is a 71 per version of this. Just absolutely fantastic. And then my number one, the reason I started doing all of these lives thing, because I saw this listed on that, Cleveland 78 show or that 78 show that's out there, there was something called the Big Medley. And I love medleys. I think what Genesis does, taking songs they know they're never going to be able to play in their entirety because otherwise they'd play like six songs a show and using like the best parts of those for medleys, like the In the Cage, Cinema Show, Superman, uh, sometimes uh, what that, Wind and Weathering song thrown in there. That after that medley, one of my favorite Genesis things. So to see Yes doing a medley, they start off with a full version of Time and a Word. Fantastic. That goes into kind of the same version that's on Yes Shows, but the Yes Shows segues directly into going for the one. This segues directly into a really solid tight, not fully played, but kind of we get a little bit of every part, long distance run around. Then, then we go into this extended segue from long distance into the fish. We drop into the fish, and right when it seems like we're about to like commit to the fish, we go into survival and all of a sudden we got John singing survival lyrics and we got a little bit survival energy guitar wise. And then we kind of go back to the fish for a while and then we go back to survival and then we go back to the fish for a while and jam out on the fish. And at this point in time, this is one of the greatest things yes has ever done. It is just so feels so jammy and organic. And it seems like something like fish or the dead or Mo would do, but then when fish starts to wind up, the fish starts to wind up, we somehow end up in perpetual change. And we're like in the middle of perpetual change. Like we don't start in the beginning, we like start in the middle and we get like a verse course and then we get the crazy, you know, dual section where they're jamming out and then we get the final verse and we're going off and in the end and we're starting to go into the solo and then we, instead of going into the jam at the end, we're at like the gates of delirium. Like we've just, like passed through the gates of delirium. So we get the very last parts of like the aggressive electric sort of attacking gates of delirium. And we get those last sort of 30 seconds of music. And then we calm down and the entire thing finishes out with soon. Soon. One of the greatest things they've ever done. Just soon. We close out with soon. It is 25, almost 26 minutes of yes, just completely at the top of their game. It is fantastic. Yeah, so anyways, that's what they look like uh, right there. Absolutely amazing. Um, and so the question is, because I'm also doing two other things, I'm going to uh, also, I have a top 10 list of the top 10 live things I've heard from yes so far, and... Do any of these things make the top 10 list? Well, the top 10 list is right. Uh, yeah, so four of them uh, made the top 10 list. Uh, we have the big medley all the way up at number one. Yeah, it took over, over that top spot. 
uh, from the Yes songs, Yours is No Disgrace, which is one of my favorite things ever. Um, and then at the bottom, the next three songs, America, Every Days, and Sweet Dreams knocked off uh, another version of Ritual. One of the reasons it knocked it off is because I already have Ritual on the list. Knocked off a Hold On and knocked off another version of Yours is No Disgrace. So yeah, four easily. I mean, if the other stuff wasn't so strong. You're probably throwing a couple other things. But yeah, easily. Four songs from this made what I, or my top 10 favorite at this point. Of course, it might be recency bias because it is the thing I most recently listened to from Yes. But yeah, this is a really good release, people. This is a really good release. In fact, where would I rank this release according to all the others? Right there. It's at number two. Can't be Yes songs. I think the one thing, as good as the big medley is, I think the one thing that maybe would have pushed it over for me as far as just, I mean, they're both three CD sets, right? Two CDs, three L LPs. Um, no, they're different length. Um, is those massive songs. Had there been a ritual, had there been, you know, Gates of Delirium, had there been a Close to the Edge, had there been something a little more epic like that, that though I know those don't change drastically live, um, I do think I like the cohesion of Yes songs and the consistency of Yes songs slightly over the word. You know, we got a couple throwaway things at the bottom, Circus of Heaven, those, you know, uh, shoot high, aim low, rhythm of love, all that kind of stuff. Waters down the potency of the word a little bit, but this is, this is a fantastic, fantastic release. Really good. It's up there. It's close. Like, oh, I mean, yes, songs, uh, that just may be, uh, you know, the, uh, that, I had that triple LP, the vinyl, just looking at those gatefolds. It's a special place in my heart. Um, I don't know, it's close, but the word, yeah, it's close. This is a good, it's a good release, people. This is a good release. Well, that's all I got. Uh, thanks for watching. Let me know what you think of this album. If, you, if you've if you heard it, if you haven't heard it and you decide to check it out, uh, let me know your thoughts on the songs I think are good, on the songs I think are bad. Change my mind about something. You know how it works, people. All right, that's all I got. Thanks for watching. Uh, subscribe, like, share, listen, and go listen to music. Comment, go listen to music. Go listen to the big medley if you have not heard it. It is fantastic. Peace. Talk to you later.